In Ursula K. Le Guin's third Earthsea novel, The Farthest Shore, a little bit before the halfway point of the book, we see Ged the Archmage taking Aaron with him in disguise as just ordinary people going to two of the many islands of Earthsea to try to figure out what's actually happening, to try to trace the trouble to its source. And at one point, this is in chapter six, Ged, Sparrowhawk, says that I think we must come not only to a place, but a person. This is evil, evil what passes on this island, this loss of craft and pride, this joylessness, this waste. This is the work of an evil will, but a will not even bent here, not even noticing Acheren or Lorbanery. The track we hunt is a track of wreckage, as if we followed a runaway cart down a mountainside and watched it set off an avalanche. So there is some sort of evil agency or entity that is doing something, but the damage and in particular the despair that we're seeing spread throughout these islands where magic is failing, luck is failing, craft and knowledge is failing, and personal relationships are becoming undone is one that was not intended out of malice, but rather is an effect of this. And so we can talk about despair is perhaps one of the best names for what we see going on in Hort Town and even more so in Lorbonnery. There's some similar interesting dynamics that are taking place. In Hort Town, it's exacerbated by the widespread use of an addiction to a drug. And Le Guin depicts it like this. Um, here we go. They turned aside into a passage between high red windowless house walls, which ran along the hillside and through an archway garlanded with decaying banners, out again into the sunlight into a steep square, another marketplace, crowded with booths and stalls and swarming with people and flies. Around the edges of the square, a number of men and women were sitting or lying on their backs, motionless. Their mouths had a curious blackish look as if they'd been bruised and around their lips, flies swarmed and gathered in clusters like bunches of dried currants. So many, said Sparrowhawk's voice, low and hasty as if he'd too gotten a shock. But when Aaron looked at him, there was the blunt, bland face of the hardy trader Hawk. What's wrong with these people? Hazia. It soothes and numbs, letting the body be free of the mind, and the mind roams free. But when it returns to the body, it needs more hazia, and the craving grows, and the life is short, for the stuff is poison. First there's a trembling, later paralysis, and then death. Aaron looked at a woman sitting with her back to a sun-warmed wall. She had raised her hand as if to brush the flies from her face, but the hand made a jerky circular motion in the air as if she'd quite forgotten about it and was moved only by the repeating surgy, surging of a palsy or shaking in the muscles. The gesture was like an incantation, emptied of all intention, a spell without meaning. And so we have a mockery here of magic, intoxication, a uh, effect of the drug separating the mind from the body, producing addiction on the part of many people. And as we're going to see with the former mage hair, all sorts of delusions as well. He tries to get Ged and Aaron to eat Hazia with him, which they you know, prudently don't do. And he claims to have gone to all sorts of other places in his drug delusions. We're going to talk about him shortly. First, though, we have to talk about this more general malaise that shows itself in different ways. So in Hort Town, where things are not quite as bad as they are on Lorbanery, it's Aaron uh, who, who recognizes some things. And as Le Guin recounts it, she says, there was indeed something wrong about Hort Town, wrong in the very air, so one might think seriously it lay under a curse, but this was not a presence of any quality, rather an absence, a weakening of all qualities, like a sickness that soon infected the spirit of any 
visitor. The squares and streets bustled with activity and business, but there was neither order nor prosperity. Well, we'll see that even more so in La Bonnery. Goods were poor, prices high, the markets were unsafe for vendors and buyers alike. Being full of thieves and ro roaming gangs, not many women were on the streets, and the few there were appeared mostly in groups. It was a city without law and governance. Talking with people, Aaron and Sparrowhawk soon learned there was no, no consul or mayor or lord left in Horktown. Some of those who used to rule had died, some resigned, some had been assassinated. There was no center left to the city. The people, for all their restless activity, seemed purposeless. Craftsmen seemed to lack the will to work well. Even the robbers robbed because it was all they knew how to do. All the brawl and brightness of a great port city was there on the surface, but around the edges of it sat the Hazia eaters, motionless, and under the surface things did not seem entirely real. Not even the faces, the sounds, the smells. They would fade away. So what we have depicted here is a, a kind of lifeless, only existing on the surfaces, existence, not just of one person, but spread throughout the entire town, the entire society. There's no center left is the best way to put it. There's nothing that can provide centering. When we look at Lorbonnery, this island where they are seeking out the uh, famous dyers of Lorbonnery, the people just gather together in this, this tavern and essentially bitch and whine. They complain about how things aren't good anymore. And um, one of them actually says, here we go, the lux run out. Uh, that's what the lux run out. After that, there was not much more to say. The villagers departed by twos and threes. Before that, of course, they're, they're claiming that, you know, the seasons have been poor. Scarcity puts up the prices. Nobody really knows whether the dyes are any good anymore. And so there's, again, this malaise. And Aaron, again, is, is a, a good person for talking about this. He says, they're strange here. It's that way with everything. They don't know the difference. Like what one of them said to the headman last night, you wouldn't know the true azure from blue mud. They complain about bad times, but they don't know when the bad times began. They say the work's shoddy, but they don't improve it. They don't even know the difference between an artisan and a spell worker, between handicraft and art magic. Here's the key. It's as if they had no lines and distinctions and colors clear in their heads. Everything is the same to them. Everything's gray. And then the uh, Ged says, what is it they're missing? And Aaron says without hesitation, joy in life. There is no more joy in life there for them. And they, because of that, don't know the difference between different things. It's as if without joy or appreciation for goods, their desires just go astray. A little bit later, there's an interesting exchange as the people of Lorbonnery are trying to get these, these uh, foreigners out of, out of there. Um, the mayor says, people come to Lorbonnery for silk. They don't come for stones. They don't come for charms or arm wavings and jibber jabber and sorcerer's trick. Honest folk live here and do honest work. Interesting slogan, right? And he says, and we don't want any other sort here, people from foreign parts snooping about and prying into our business. And everybody else is saying, he's right, that's right. And if there was any sorcerer around here that wasn't crazy, we'd give him an honest job in the sheds, but they don't know how to do honest work. And then Sparrowhawk or Ged says to them, they might if there was any to do. See, you people don't actually do any honest work. Your sheds are empty. Your orchards are untended. The silk in your warehouses was all woven years ago. What do you actually do here in La Bonnery? And then the mayor says something really interesting. We look after our own business, right? And th their own business is basically doing nothing but living in their glories of the past and complaining about the scarcities and bad luck of the present. And now think about this. 
these sort of uh, existences, the despair that's going on, the better times, the directionlessness, the lack of joy, the drug addiction, this is a stand-in for so many other places, and this is happening in the narrative world of Earthsea. Something that's a bit unique to it is the various ruined people of power that Ged and Aaron are running across. The first one is not actually ruined because she willfully withdrew from things as she saw the proverbial writing on the wall. Ged says to her, um, when I was here years ago, I saw you pulling flames out of men's ears. Then you made the flames turn into birds and golden bells. What was going on? Why aren't you doing that? And the woman says, listen, we don't do those tricks anymore. People don't want them. They've seen through them. They're the, these mirrors now, I see you remember my mirrors. You can puzzle a man's mind with the flashing of the mirrors and with words, but I don't do that. It was tricks, fooleries. You can fool men, but the, after they've been fooled, they get angry and lose their pleasure in such things. So I turned my attention to this trade, selling uh, garments or selling silk, selling cloth, right? Then we run into hair the mage, and he is a genuinely ruined person. He's become addicted to Hazia. He thinks that he's having all sorts of visions of great things that he's willing to try to show uh, to, to get. He's encountered the evil presence that is wrecking things. He's also lost his hand, which he needed. And as Ged points out to him, you must have stopped being a mage before you lost your hand, because if you were a mage, you wouldn't have lost your hand. You would have been able to prevent it. And Hare tells him that, here we go, I'm not, I, I'm only, uh, here we go, I remember being alive and I knew the words and names, and Ged says, are you dead now? No, alive, I'm not dead, I sleep sometimes, sleep comes very close to death. The dead walk in dreams, everyone knows that. They come to you alive and they say things. Uh, and you, you can follow them and you can find it if you know where to look, if you're willing to pay the price. And, and Gad says, what's the price? Life, what else? What else can you buy life with uh, but life? And he goes on and he says, men of power have to give it up. They have to pay. Pay what? They pay with their power. And he says, I'll, I'll use Hazia to show you the way tonight. You can see where I've gone. And so what we find out is that, that Hare is just a wreck of a, a human being. He's lost his power. He thinks he's got something better in taking this drug. Then at Lorbonnery, we have this mother and son, the dyers of Lorbonnery. And these are people of power as well. They are not uh, mages, but they are people who used magic in their dying. And this is why the, the cloths of Lobonary dyed with their dyes were so wonderful and fetched such a great price. So what we find is that first he, he runs across um, the mother and she's in a very bad way. So first she, she you know, says, curse you thieves, and, and Sparrowhawk says, avert, right? And uh, she recognizes him as a person of power as well. And she says then, <clears throat> my power kept me from life, so I lost it. I lost all the things I knew, all the words and names. They came by little strings like spider webs out of my eyes and mouth. And here she says something very important. There's a hole in the world, and light is running out of it. And the words go with the light. Did you know that? My son sits staring all day at the dark looking for the hole in the world. He says he would see better if he were blind. <clears throat> they, they go on as well. And then um, she, she thinks that he is the great man, the king of shadows, the lord of the dark place. And Ged says, I am not that. And then she says, I'll tell you a secret. I don't want to live and live and live forever. I would rather have back the names of things, but they're all gone. Names don't matter anymore. There are no more secrets. Do you wish to know my name? And she does reveal her name, Acheron. This is a very big thing in Earthsea where giving a person's name gives power 
over them. She is in such despair that she doesn't care who has them. She says, now they all know my secret name, my true name. There are no secrets. There is no truth. There is no death, death, death. Gad gives her a new name. He whispers in her ear so that she now is no longer so vulnerable. And then he goes to find her son, Sopli, the other dyer. And what do we find out about him? Sopli has also given up his, his own power and wants to find this king in darkness. He says, I found the hole in the darkness. The king was standing there. He watches it. He rules it. It had a little flame, a little candle in his hand. He blew on it and it went out. Then he blew on it again and it burned. It burned. He wants to find this place where the king comes out, a place, uh, he says, because he's alive, not just the spirits, the ghosts that come over the wall, not just like that. You can't bring anything but souls over the wall, but this is the body. This is the flesh immortal. I know that he has overcome death. I know it. I gave my wizardry to know it. I was a wizard once, and you know it, and you are going there. So what we find with these people of power is either they've, they've abandoned their whatever their wizardry or sorcery or witchcraft that they were doing before, like the cloth seller, or it's been exchanged for some sort of promise of eternal life in the flesh, not just across the wall of stones in the land of the dead, but it's bringing ruin with it. It's bringing despair. It's bringing an end to all things. And we have this pervasive evil that is taking place in all these different dimensions in Hort Town and in Lorbanery, representing the sickness, the imbalance that now has to be addressed.